uh, the right view. We are. Yes. Perfect. Looking good. Perfect. <laughs> Done. We've solved for world peace, people. Done. <laughs> uh, so, do you know, are we going to start now or, or what, what's your thoughts? Uh, right now, guys. Let's start Can now, you? yes. Okay, okay. Uh, there, there, there is an antitrust. Uh, I'm actually not in front of that, but uh, um, Julian, we should we need on. that, or we are good. I think you need to know that everyone that there is an antitrust. We uh, we uh, and you can go and read that oh, on the website. We'll send we'll we'll information about that out so yeah. everyone can see that, right? And I think today we'll just go straight mm -hmm. into the um, presentation. But please, was, awesome. antitrust policy. Awesome. Over to you, also. Okay, oh, thank you so much. Uh, if everyone can go into mute, um, just just through the session, I think that's going to help. So we have a little bit less background noise. Um, there we go. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, uh, firstly, for inviting me. Um, it really feels like, um, it almost feels like, Julian, I'm returning to a place where we started a conversation about three or four years ago. For those who don't know, I already know Julian from... Uh, my past uh, and looking into blockchain technologies. And I'm really, I, I feel privileged for, for being invited to the session today. Um, I have a small agenda that I'm gonna run through. Um, nothing too complicated. Uh, the first thing is I just wanna introduce myself, then the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, who I work for, and then ultimately the, the DSI itself, um, which is an initiative that I'll be leading. After that, for those on the call who already know what trade processes look like, I do apologize. Um, I'm going to just give a little bit of an overview of what a generic trade process looks like and some of the complexities there, but I won't spend a lot of time on that. And it's just to help people, especially those who have, let's say, a technological background, but not necessarily a trade background to, to get a foundational understanding of what we're talking about. And then after that, I'm going to focus in on what the DSI itself is actually going to do. So practically speaking, what are our focus points and what is it that we, we, we think we can uh, contribute on um, and help solve for? So that, that in a high level is uh, some of the, the points we'll cover. Uh, for the first three, I don't have any slides. So it's just gonna be a conversation. And then for, for uh, the fourth and the fifth item, there's a few slides, but not too many. Uh, so hopefully not death by PowerPoint, if you will. And so, uh, so let's start with the first one. Um, I'm Oswald Kaler, and I lead the DSI initiative working for the ICC. I started my professional career about 15 years ago as a technologist, a Java 2 developer. Um, absolutely love technology and all of the various things it can enable. And I look at my career and I, I feel like I've had two chapters to it. The first chapter was specifically focused on enabling solutions for organizations where we digitized a lot of the processes within a company um, and did things like records management or business process management, a lot of fun. The second part of my journey, um, I moved out of technology and into a commercial division at BHP. And over there, I focused on quite a lot of cool stuff too, uh, whether it was R&D, looking at blockchain, analytics, and a few other elements. Um, and when the DSI uh, role opened up on the internet, I looked at that and went, this is perfect. He has a challenge that we've all been trying to solve for in different ways, and hopefully it's something that I can help contribute uh, towards. And so who's the ICC? Why, why the ICC? What, what really interested me in it? Uh, it's not an organization that I think a lot of technologists are familiar with. So I'm going to spend a, a minute or two just on that. The ICC is the institutional representative of 45 million companies globally. Now, why, why do I mention that? I think it's important when you look at us not to think of us as coming from any specific company or even industry. Our focus is helping companies across all the various industries uh, be successful. So that's the first thing. So we have quite a big scale when it comes to our membership count. And the second thing that I think is very important to also know is that we're not sp specifically focused on any specific country or region. We're over a hundred different countries globally. And so that immediately gives us both, uh, you know, from a membership, but also country perspective scale. 
to be across industry and cross regional challenges and helping businesses succeed in that context. And so when we think about the ICC from a capability perspective, they already have standard, you know, uh, we have products like Incoterms and EUCP and a few others that already help fuel trade globally um, on an annual basis. And so we both have scale, the ICC has scale, but it also has capabilities for, sport, for creating standards and bringing people together. And so that gives you a little bit of a view of the ICC. Um, the third item is the DSI. So if that's the ICC, if that's the scaling capability, well, what's the DSI? In a nutshell, if you've seen the press, basically what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and harmonize all the various platforms out there today. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later in the session. Our view is that there's a lot of great digital platforms and these have been enormously instrumental in helping build resilience, especially during a pandemic. Um, enabling a lot of people to already transition off paper and trade and onto electronic platforms. The challenge though, is when we actually get to some of these complex uh, environments, business networks, where uh, you know, firstly you're executing across different regions and maybe you have thousands of customers and some of them have their own platforms, it becomes challenging to operate in that landscape. And we'll touch a bit on that. But fundamentally, the DSI, it's not that we're going to build a new platform. We want to produce standards. And we want to produce the standards that people can pick up almost like a sort of business requirements and contribute into that landscape um, and, and remove some of the boundaries and the barriers that, that exist today. And we'll touch a bit more on that. But that, in a nutshell, is both me, technologist by heart, the ICC, global scale, global reach across various industries, and the DSI, our superpower standards, and we want to have all of you succeed by seeing your membership numbers go up, volumes go up, and all of that. So I am, for those on the call who uh, are fully familiar with trade processes, please bear with me. <laughs> this is gonna be very high level, and it really is just for people who don't have appreciation of some of the complexity so that when we actually talk a bit about those enablers that the DSI is going to solve for, we have some form of understanding of, of, of the environment that we're operating in. And so these aren't the most beautiful slides, but imagine it's a whiteboard and I drew some of these on the whiteboard. So when I talk to a lot of people, especially uh, people uh, in the tech sector, they view trade as basically just an activity between a buyer and a seller. And that the easiest way to solve it is to get uh, you know, all the sellers to uh, get all their buyers onto a platform, the same platform, and then boom, you know, Bob's your uncle, you can execute trade. And while there's a lot of use cases where that is exactly that's how it works, that's relevant, uh, when it actually comes to international trade, it's a little bit more complex. And so if I have a look at the next picture, this is the, the purpose of this is just to give you a little bit of an overview of the various different actors that might be involved um, when you actually execute trade. Firstly, you'll see there's two banks. So you might have a nomination bank, issuing bank, et cetera, as a part of that process. There's different carriers, different ports. You might have different vessel operators. So when you think about the activity of buying and selling, it's not just between two entities. There's actually quite a few players involved in that process that if you want them to participate in it, uh, potentially need to have access to some of the information that it gets executed and shared throughout that process. I think the second thing that's worth highlighting is that, and it's something that a few of my previous colleagues were quite surprised at, is the absolute quantity of documentation that's actually required in the process. So it's not just an activity that happens without documentation, there's some actual requirements behind it. Um, and a little stack that goes uh, with it. And there's quite an interesting history, for example, behind Bill of Lading and where it originated from and where it is today. And, and one can argue that a revolution is required in that space. The second one is that a lot of countries, and especially when you actually get to the port and you want to enter the country, there's actually requirements to have physical documentation or uh, and physical signatures um, as a part of that process. Now, Rule books and bilateral agreements and the platforms can solve for that. But there's still a few countries like, for example, China, where in theory, you still need a physical bill of lading to actually execute a, a, a trade there. And I think the third one is, again, if you just think about the complexity, 
Uh, you know, sellers can have sellers and buyers and ports. They can all have their own individual platforms, which uniquely cater to some of their use cases and requirements. And you don't necessarily want to continuously go into a platform, exit a platform, into a platform, exit a platform as you actually execute trade uh, with a single customer. And so I have just a few little notes here. Um, so the first one is, it would be perfect if everyone in this chain was on the same platform and just using it uh, to execute a deal. What we find though is an environment that's sometimes a little bit more complex, where potentially a port might actually have its own platform that it would like you to leverage. The second one is where some of the, 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 the carriers like Maersk and them might have a platform, a, a, as you know, um, that also adds quite a lot of great uh, benefits to the process. And some of the carriers themselves might have it too. Um, and some of the banks might have theirs. And so I think the moral of the story is that it's not so much a landscape of a single entity with a single platform but more a ecosystem of different platforms doing different, uh, uh, different sets of work great um, in, the, uh, in the landscape. And so with that complexity in mind, um, it's not saying that there won't be one or two or three big platforms ultimately you know, facilitating all trade. It's just highlighting that sometimes it's, it's a bit complex in the landscape where we find it today. And you can see it in the numbers when we look at electronic bill of lading adoption globally, it's still in the single digits. And when we think about our journey that we've done there is when it comes to non-blockchain platforms, we've invested about two to three decades in that journey. And when it comes to blockchain itself, there's about a half a decade into, into those technologies. And so the upside is there's still a lot of growth. There's still a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for all of us to actually contribute into that space, which I think is very valuable. Now, that is the, the big point of all those previous uh, slides was just to, again, touch on the fact that it's a little bit more complex. It's not just about a buyer and seller being on the same platform. There's a lot of different uh, par uh, you know, parties involved, a lot of documentation, and there's also a legislative element to it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spend a little bit of time on just what we believe some of the key elements are that uh, we want to address as a part of the ICC DSI. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see how that goes. So, <laughs> so where does this list of six come from? When I got the role about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, the ICC was already executing workshops with you know different groups of people uh, to kind of get an understanding of what are some of the challenges when it comes to digitization and trade. And so a lot of great work came out of that that highlighted the need for a few elements as an example, interoperable rule books could be one of them. Um, in addition to that, I've probably, I don't want to use a number because the number will always be wrong, but let's say I've, I've engaged about 50 different organizations in various different industry sectors to get a sense from them how are their projects going? What's working? What's not working? And more importantly, what do they believe the ICC can bring to this challenge of scale, getting scale when it comes to digitization of trade? And we've landed on six items, um, quite big, but six nonetheless. And what I'll do is I'll briefly touch on each of them and give you a little bit of a flavor of what they are. And, and some of them even an update on what our thinking is at the moment. Now, reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, feedback really is a gift. The last thing we want to do is set off on a journey and a year later have someone go, oh, we kind of knew that this is, you know, this other element is needed. Um, so please do reach out. Uh, it's going to be very valuable. Anyway, so if we look at the six, the very first one is we need to unify some of the digital standard efforts uh, across the, the globe. So when I approach it from, let's say, a developer angle, it's quite hard to know what's actually happening in the standard landscape and what can I actually just pick up and use. Uh, we see that ISOs are a part of, you know, the process of creating standards and blockchain, but every single industry also has a consortia trying to solve for different blockchain activities. Some of the larger multilateral organizations are also investing and in, in setting up standards. Um, and then you also have some development banks globally seeding activity when it comes to creating standards and governance. 
So the very first thing we're going to do is simplify that landscape a little bit, make it easier for people to know what's actually happening and where, make it easier for people who actually are going to be leveraging the standards to know where can they actually go and participate and, and, and engage, and also where it makes sense, harmonize some of that effort to ensure that if someone in the shipping space, for example, is already solving for electronic bill of lading standards, you know, we don't necessarily need to do that 10 times. So let, let's find a, a more constructive way of actually approaching that. The second one, and this is a big one, in my mind at least, is the legislative reforms needed. There's a model law called MLETR, the Model Law for Electronic Transferable Records uh, that UNCTRAL has created. And it's a beautiful model law. It actually enables, when countries adopt it, for us to solve a lot of the challenges we have today when it actually comes to the acceptance of digital records internationally. Um, so it's been adopted by a single country and there's a huge upside in uh, if we can get more countries to adopt it. It's going to even help with some of the complexity we have in the rule books um, and the various uh, platforms. And so this is an area where we believe as the ITC, we can uniquely go and really push um, and work with companies and work with governments around the world to see how do we actually accelerate that adoption. Fully appreciate that, you know, it might take three, four or five years to get some of the larger trade nations or the larger strategic trade routes in the world um, on board, but that's fine. As long as we know who's it that we're targeting, how are we gonna enable them and how are we progressing? And so you'll see a lot of our energy and attention is going to go into that and you, you, you'll be the beneficiary of a lot of that work. The third one, before I get to the actual standards themselves, um, is on the rulebook side. Um, there's a lot of non-blockchain and blockchain platforms out there today that facilitate for similar processes with similar documents, uh, documentation behind it. Um, and they make up for the lack of legal harmonization globally by having everyone agree to a single rule book and that provides a really good legal foundation for people to execute it. And so the question that we have as the ICC, and it's gonna be one of the first sprints that we do, is when we bring everyone together in a room, is there an ability for us to actually create a rule book that is interoperable, that different platforms can leverage um, and can actually, when you technically integrate the platform, you can start a trade process on one platform and end settlement in another platform. And so it might be difficult, but it's definitely something we need to focus on and see how do we get that done. Now, these three items are still very much on the legal side and, and uh, just, you know, orchestration, getting everyone in the, in, in the room uh, and focus. The, the next three items on our scope is going to be the ones, and I almost refer to them as, and I hate to say this, but it's almost like business requirement specifications. So at the highest level, so number four is, how do we do cross industry standards for, for elements that are applicable across industry? And so an example of that could be legally uh, legal entities as, as an example. When you go to the different platforms today, or even the different consortia that are focusing on solving for some of these trade challenges today, one of the things a lot of them are focused on is, well, how do we define identity in our context? And there's a lot of value if we can actually take identity and solve for that at a global scale, as opposed to having it done in various different unique ways um, within the different platforms. Now, Good news is there's already a lot of great work being done. And so there's, for example, Gleef is there, Swift has Beck, and there's quite a few other um, options on the table. And the big set of work is really, how do we get all of that together? How do we workshop and really figure out what will work when it comes to legal identity itself? So not vehicle, because that's already been solved, but legal itself. And and then how do we, how do we translate that into a standard that can be applied and scaled? Um, the benefit uh, would be enormous. That's one example. If I think about number five, so four is cross industry data points. Number five for us is looking at industry specifically. And so, you know, you have the shippers, you have commodity, uh, et cetera. And the question uh, in my mind is how do we make sure 
that we're solving for some of these, these challenges in a way that are scaled. And so I'll give you an example. When you go to some of the, the consortia outside of shipping, they're also solving for electronic bill of lading. When you go to like the DCSA's website, there's a initiative solving for electronic bill of lading. You know, Merck has electronic bill of lading. And so is there an opportunity for us here to actually go and standardize the information architecture and governance around something like an eBill? And how do we ensure that more platforms can actually leverage e electronic bills of lading in the future and, and not less? And so again, this is gonna be one of the areas where we're gonna to have to work with a lot of players and hopefully even members on this call to say, how do we solve this? A, is, is it required? And B, if it is required, what's the solution? Now, to be very transparent, uh, there's a reason I use identity and electronic bill of lading as the two examples. And the reason for that is most of the exporter and importer companies that I've been speaking, speaking to in the last four weeks have highlighted those as two key areas that if we could address that as a starting point would probably help alleviate some of the challenges that they are facing today. The final one, um, and to me this, I'm, I'm not too concerned about number six because I think that's the simpler one to, to potentially do which is, is there an opportunity for us to actually create standards when it comes on a platform level? So for example, API gateways or, or you know, how do we do asset exchanges or communication? And we already have ISO TC307, for example, focusing on some of the blockchain uh, specific standards. And the question is, are there any other opportunities? Is there anything else that needs to be solved for so that someone who steps out of college, if they wanted to create a platform, and they wanted to create an, an application that can contribute to the trade landscape, they can pick up a bunch of standards, produce a platform, and it can both connect to the existing landscapes. They can pick up standards on identity and go, this is how I deal with identity, pick up standards for all the other type of content that's required um, through the trade process and, and continue their contribution. And so these are, in summary, when you think about the ICC DSI, these are the six key areas that we believe we can uniquely focus on and we can help uh, with. Now, in closing, I have a, a few key principles that I wanna share. The first one is we don't wanna reinvent the wheel. If we have to go and reinvent the wheel for a lot of the activity and the, the definition that has already been done by consortia or even by platform owners themselves, it's going to take me another two to three years just to get to where a lot of you are already at. And so the whole objective is not to start from zero. It's to start from, from, uh, from within every industry, there'll be a different starting point. The second one is the DSI itself is all about standard production. So it's not that I'm interested in building a platform that now is going to, you know, if, if I get all the buyers and sellers onto it, boom, interoperability is solved for no. My core product is going to be working with people, finding where do we actually create standards that people can pick up, produce solutions that ultimately scale. Anyway, so I do apologize for that big monologue, but that in a nutshell is the talk for today high level overview on trade and that it's more complex than just two parties are uh, engaging each other. Lots of documentation required. There's a legal angle. And these are the six key areas that we will be focusing on. If you wanna contribute in any of it, please reach out to me. I am on LinkedIn or reach out to anyone in the SIG, the SIG. Um, I'm pretty sure they know how to, to navigate to myself. And so that is it for us for today. Any thoughts, comments, or questions? Uh, Julian, what's your thoughts? <laughs> I think it's excellent. Thank you. And it's a great initiative. So you started only five, six weeks ago. Is that what you were saying? Uh, where, yes. Where were you all this time? <laughs> you were missing in hi hibernation. <laughs> You know, it's actually quite interesting. Julian and I had a similar conversation a few years ago, and so it was a little bit easy getting to this point. So I have to, I have to uh, admit that. Um, and it looks easy. I think it's going to be a lot of hard work, and it's going to also take a level of maturity. And so I'll give you an example. I spoke to 
you know, you speak to a few commodity players and you go, look, you know, you need evil, but it's not necessarily something you have to solve for yourself. It's something that potentially another industry can do. And as long as we can leverage that, we'll finally get to scale. And I, so I see a big part of my role is also just orchestrating, making sure the right people are having the right type of conversation um, and that we're optimizing what we're solving for. So yeah, so, the, so it's been four weeks, uh, Julian, I think yeah. almost five weeks now, to be quite honest. Um, I call it four weeks because we didn't do the public announcement until um, uh, the GTR conference, so about four weeks of engagement. Cool, cool, cool. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I would just to make my comments. I, I really love the this initiative uh, for basically one reason. It's uh, I think it's giving a very comprehensive approach uh, from 360 degrees on uh, on an, all the different areas that are embracing in terms of the digitalization of international trade not just yeah. from technology point of view, but also from legal point of view, that actually is my background uh, <laughs> from trade, uh, from uh, standards, from technology. So I think it's, this is uh, what uh, the institution needs in driving this change of, so of a new approach of uh, this uh, technology, DLT in general, uh, because I've seen, uh, I mean, we were discussing also with Parma recently, uh, a new approach to solve these issues is coming and it is, and it is national approach. And uh, it's more oriented on um, organization, on a national government that had to take the lead and embracing different kind of DLT projects for capital market, for trade, uh, and for other solutions for the supply chain and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I really love because they, I think this is a great and a concrete example of what the government needs. And I mean, the go if the government <laughs> takes the lead, so we, for sure we're gonna have a, a further and quicker implementation in the future. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think it's, it's everyone using the capabilities that they have uh, as a part of the puzzle pieces, right? And so when you think about a lot of the work, and I think again about the work that Atul and them did on DLT ledgers and the announcement we saw this week, you know, everyone has their unique capabilities and they can do really great work. And so I feel like, and, and someone asked me yesterday whether or not, you know, why digital standards are... Um, are now such a topical conversation. And my, my view was actually, I don't think digital standards is a topical conversation. I think digital is. With the pandemic, it has highlighted the power that a lot of these platforms that people like yourselves have built. And without these platforms, we would have been in a lot of pain today. Secondly, because of a lot of the great innovation and work that's already been done, when we saw all of these fraud cases pop up, it wasn't too long after that when we saw DLT ledgers go, boom, you know, yeah, is a way to solve for it. And so all of those great capabilities are already solving for, for a lot of these use cases. Where the ICC needs to come in, though, is, is say, how do we help scale? How do we help two different, and I think about these two people. I think about the developer and I think about the executive. If I'm a developer, where can I actually go in this landscape of standards to pick up the stuff that I can almost use like business requirements to build a platform that contributes value? And, and how do we make that easier so we can get even more innovation going and so that we don't have people locked out just because they, let me not even go into that, but there's a few barriers today. The second thing is I'm thinking about the executive who's sitting there going, and whether it's for a small company or a large one, I want to join one of these platforms, but I don't necessarily have the manpower to go convince all of my, uh, my customers or all of my banks or whoever to get onto this platform. And so when we have interoperability, when we have standards that enable it, it makes that decision so much easier. They can look at the solutions and go, I really like this one because it's innovative, because it solves for all the things I want. And I now know that if my customer is on a different platform, I can still get that value. 
and I don't have to worry and I can get end-to-end -end processing. So sorry, I can go off on a tangent. You guys need to stop me. But this is what excites me. And I see two steps. I see an evolutionary step and a revolutionary step. The evolution is let's just get people off paper. It's been, one, it's been far too long and we still have way too many, for example, electronic bills of lading floating around. I mean, bills of lading floating around. So there is an evolutionary step that's required. But as you all know, and I don't have to convince you, blockchain will enable the revolution. It will enable us to rethink how we do a lot of these activities. It will change some of the services that we can have. It will uniquely contribute to the trade gap. It was $1.5 trillion just the other day. I think it's now sitting at $3 trillion, people being excluded from trade. Blockchain can bring new, new, new partners into it. So yeah, so I'm quite excited. I'm quite excited. And I think we have a, a key part to play as the ICC. Thank you, Oswald. Thanks for, for this. I mean, you said it all. Uh, I just wanted to add something, but you, you did yourself. I mean, the trade gap, uh, the revolutionary aspect of blockchain, it's going to be, you know, a big revolution. And this is definitely, from a trade finance specialist, definitely this is what the industry needs for. If it doesn't want to die, of course, because certain aspects are quite critical. In this moment, they are facing a crisis. And I tell you, from a practitioner's situation can no longer go on this way. So we do need the evolution, of course, but the revolution is even more essential, in my opinion. We do need to revolutionize procedures, the products, uh, and everything that follows, you know, uh, it's uh, it's a long term history, you know, dating back to Renaissance. Now let's let's go further with respect to these. So, does anybody else want to to ask anything to Oswald? Yes, if I can ask a question. Hi, Oswald. It's Joe from China Systems. We've been corresponding on LinkedIn a little bit. Uh, well, first of all, I think I like your approach. Um, you know, it's you have to start high level because you've got quite a challenge on your hands. Yeah, uh, I, I think the picture you would draw with all the existing platforms, the world today, there's a lot of platforms in place. So I think portable digital identity and portability of documents, I think, are, are going to be key. Uh, to actually to enable all those platforms to actually offer their functionality. No one, it may take a while, as you said yourself, there may be some dominant platforms after a while, but to start off, we need to, to enable this portability of trade documents. Now, there's one key question I have for you. The DSI, the scope of standards, because I'm, I'm a strong believer, although I've been working in trade now for 32 years, I've always been seeing electronic invoicing. Yeah? Invoice is, in any trade transaction, a document. But e-invoicing and traditional trade, do you believe you should also look at, for example, Not works well. Joel, Joel, your your reception's a little bit bad. Um, are, are you asking whether uh, invoicing should be a part of the the focus? Sorry. Yes. Electronic invoicing. Do you also see yeah. that see that as part of the standards? I, I think that's a great question. The, and, and I don't just say that because, you know, they tell you to say every question is a great question. It really is. <laughs> so when you think about the trade process, one of the, the, the first things we did was I have a, pro, a, a overview of everything from the actual initial commercial contract, where everything originates from, all the way to warehouse receipts, as an example, and even invoicing. And so a lot of these are going to be instrumental and we will have to look at how do we actually solve for some of these. What we're going to do in our first sprint though, and so I'll share that once we've got into a little bit more maturity, I'll share that overview. And what's also good about that overview, it also shows people what are some of the existing standards today that are actually applicable 
to some of these documentation, which I also think is quite useful for people to know. Um, our first sprint at the moment, the thinking is that we want to do almost like quarterly sprints and see how what can we achieve in a quarter. And the view is that we might start with identity first as a foundation um, and, and get all of the right people into a room and focus on that. It's also one of the most challenging ones. So I think I'm going to lose all my hair, but we will have a, a feeling of complexity at the end of that quarter. By the way, my dad has no hair, so I'm pretty sure that's where I'm going to end up. And uh, <laughs> the second one is electronic bill of lading, just purely because I'm so passionate about it. I see so many people focused on electronic bill of lading, and I would love to see what have we done as both a blockchain industry over the last three, four years, and also the traditional platforms that already have the members and, and, and the volume and get a sense of those too. And once we've seen how good we are at that, potentially then expanding onto some of the other use cases. But that's going to potentially be our starting point, Joel. Okay, I'm not sure if, I'm, I oh. hope that answered the question. Yes, yeah. you know. The lady is the, is the document to be solved. I mean, it's the most critical one in the process due to the complexity of the document itself, variety. So first of all, I would start from there. I mean, it's... Uh, Electronic bill of lading under an EU perspective, for example, or Singapore, maybe, I don't know, the regulation over there, it is partly already sold. The real core is in the bill of lading and in some other documents when you have to issue for the document, Peter Secretary, uh, certificate of origin. That, that's real core. The complexity right. of lading. So, first, I would agree yeah. with. Uh, I agree with that, Andrea, but I think I think you've worked in data strategy, Oswald. Uh, so, a bill of lading, the origin of it, you have a shipper's letters of instruction, an SLI. The SLI, again, sources some of its data invoice. So, looking at things in isolation is, I understand why you're doing it, but from a data strategy point of view, you need to look at where does that data and that bill of lading originate. So you can't close your eyes for the, the key standards that we live in, in, in the, on the source level. And the invoice plays an important role because it flows into an SLI and the SLI flows into a bill of lading. I'm, I'm not saying this. I mean, you have to focus on what start from and seen at the global procedures in, in trade. That's the right attitude, but step by step, the real bottleneck, the real problem is in sorting out the real e bill of lading. That's the core. Then you have to look at the whole process as a streamlined process. Uh, I agree with you, it's not a problem. The real the core, in my opinion, is in the bill of lading due to the complexity of the document itself. That's and so to me, to me, what's exciting, right, Andrea and Joel, is I almost look at it as if you have identity evil and invoicing software, can you imagine the amount of fraud that you firstly get out of the system? Two, can you imagine the amount of efficiency that you get into the system? The amount of times that that, that trade can't actually transition. And this is also where the rule books are important because you, you need to solve from it from a data perspective, right? But you also need to solve for it from a legal, you know, either the country needs to, 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 to adopt you into trials model law, or we need to get rule books that can actually become interoperable and actually enable the practicality of movement of those, those data types. Now, Joel, I don't necessarily have a full appreciation of the invoice itself. And so what I think we need to do is actually have a session and I'll I'm going to find you on the LinkedIn and the messaging and schedule some time with you so we can actually dive into it because I do want to make sure that there's not an opportunity that we might be missing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it definitely deserves a, a, a larger conversation. Definitely. You Thank touched you on the, uh, as last, uh, the, the widespread adoption of model lows that don't explicitly to have a widespread adoption maybe of technology and to homogenize, let's say, so the different national legislation. 
So the very first challenge is also model laws, how to widespread adoption. That's real core, uh, in my opinion. To me, that's foundational. And for those who are on the call who don't necessarily fully appreciate the model law conversation, what it basically is, is today, if you go to various different countries, they still require you to have a physical bill of lading or a wet signature uh, when it actually comes to the transfer of title. And so the challenge that model laws ultimately solve for, and it literally is a copy and paste, uh, it's a model law that countries can take and adopt that actually solves for the whole legal um, uh, validity, if you will, of uh, digital documentation. So it enables you to actually use a digital documentation as if it was a physical in a digital world and, and execute your process. And what makes the model laws great is again, it's, it's, countries don't have to start at zero. They can literally take the model law and, and start uh, you know, the, the, the process of applying it, which is normally about a two to three year process. And to um, Andrea's point, and that's one of the reasons we have it as number two is our view is if we can spearhead the adoption of model law for electronic transferable records, it's going to solve for a lot of different use cases that even today's rule books don't solve for. And so there's a lot of energy and activity that, that needs to go into that. It's massively important. Definitely, definitely agree with you, Oswald. Uh, I have experienced this, you know, uh, not to stress this fact, but you know, when you go to Africa, when you go to Middle East, when you go to certain parts of the world, they didn't even know what uh, an electronic record is. They only do this with papers, original and copies. That's a real problem. They don't care. So you have a source of upper infrastructure obliging and forcing local activities to be carried out in compliance with the model laws. That's the challenge. Um, to be to be one, I mean, by the ICC primarily to step in a sort of upper institution. Uh, in some countries, you don't even start customs operation without a physical document, both invoices and especially bills of lading. That's why I was stressing this fact of the bill of lading. Look at the global process, but start from these ends in documents slash electronic records. That's challenging. That's, that's, I think, I, I totally agree with. I don't know, anybody else wants to add any further comments? Julian, Farm, Mark, Atul? Yeah, no, I think, um, I think uh, Oswald, first of all, welcome to the role. And uh, um, for me, I went grey, not bald, so good luck with that one. Um, so uh, have fun with the, uh, with the hair. But, uh, but certainly, um, for me, it's refreshing. Um, because we're getting DSI to get those guiding rails in place, which is converging, converging themes, technologies, processes. So we do make trade more frictionless and it plays well to some of the studies that we've done, uh, which uh, we can share. So I think it's refreshing that you've got this converging theme and setting guide rails in place. Um, yeah, it's not easy. And Joel's just highlighted a couple of elements where the devil's in the detail. But exactly, this is where feedback collaboration is going to be a key theme to deliver the vision of DSI. So looking forward to joining you on the journey. I know that uh, most of the guys on the call have been looking at this and then having this, uh, you be the North Star and uh, we can start looking in a common direction. I think it's going to be a good way forward. So yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, Palm. I really appreciate it. And a final note just from my side, my, my big objective is not to have a, a DSI empire with like a hundred different people and, you know, feeling awesome about myself. <laughs> it's really about using the capabilities in our businesses. We're the World Business Organization. And so as you look at that scope and, and the, the work we're, we're trying to do, if you feel like you have capabilities that can actually help, you know, let us know. Um, it's going to, if, if we're not inclusive, this won't work. We, you know, you need the capabilities from the different industries, from the different technology platform owners, um, specifically to solve for this. Anyway, I'm going to pause there.
before I go off on another tangent. But thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, has, has, has anybody else got any any other um, questions? Yeah. I think one thing, sorry, go ahead, at all. Uh, no, 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 I, I, I didn't have any questions. So. so I think the other thing that we can talk about is, uh, is, is what can we do as a SIG? How can we help you in this journey, which I think is a, an awesome, awesome presentation, is, is how can we do it? I mean, I talk about identity, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff around the self-sovereign identity and other things. Uh, you know, we talk about Joel, who's got some interesting stuff. Maybe we could have a, a talk here, and Joel can get, share amongst us all, right? About uh, yeah, uh, Ian voicing. How can we help you in this journey uh, on this platform that we have? So, yeah. two questions there. So, on the invoicing, I would love that actually. The more, the merrier. Uh, so that would be fantastic. The the second on your question on how can we all help each other? The the advice I give people is. Think a bit about each of you, what is your superpower, whether it's your company, your platform, or even just your own capabilities. Have a look at those six areas that we will be contributing into from an ICC perspective and where you see either your, your company's capabilities being able to solve for things where you go, we've already solved for evil, or we already have something that can do invoicing, or we, we already have something that does identity. You know, let me know again, my, if I start at zero for all of those streams, it's gonna take me another three years to get to where some of you are already at. So I think that is what my ask would be, is think about those six items, think about where you can play, and let's, let's highlight that. I'm not sure if that's specific enough, Julian, but that really is, I think, I, the best way that we can get help at, at the ICC on this. Brilliant. Any comments from anyone else? I think you picked out two, identity and EBL, right? And it sounds like we may have invoice as well. But <laughs> it, it, those are the kind of areas that you're looking for uh, as a not quick win, because I'm not sure that anything's a quick win, right? But as, a, as, as an area of uh, focus. Yeah, I was going to say, Julian, I think that uh, from, a, from a SIG point of view, uh, and we yeah. touched upon it already, the fact that um, uh, the outlook is one for inclusion and yeah. for collaboration, meaning on the other side that it, things have to be open and they have to be uh, uh, in a form and a shape that at the core has interoperability built into things. Um, as Oswald was saying from, a, from, a, from a, uh, an evolution to a revolution. Um, but the, the dynamic or the optic, which I thought was really interesting, which I think where the SIG could come in is when you're looking at it, Oswald, from, as you said, the executive and the developer point of view. And that developer community point of view has to be open source. And with that in mind, I think Julian uh, and uh, Andrea, Eugenio and uh, Atul from a SIG point of view for Hyperledger, that's an angle where there's a whole portfolio of open source capabilities that will be the building blocks potentially for what could be, you know, this method of having this, uh, this unified platform with a rule book. But I think the technology from a developer point of view of open source capabilities, I think is one angle to have a look at. Okay. Sure. That, that makes will, sense. Yep. Makes sense. Yes, definitely. We should join. I mean, look at ourselves and see how we can go on with this uh, very soon, I guess. So, anybody else uh, would like to, to step in the discussion and give his point of view, ask questions? Yeah. So, it's Kev, Kevin here from Kevin Gill CTO. Hey, Kevin. From IBM. Um, one of the observations I've made, I spent a lot of time in insurance and insurance has very good standards across it, things like the Accord standard. So it's easy to join up products. In the shipping space, I worked at the beginning of the year on a, a, a shipping solution and there aren't a lot of standards. So this initiative to actually bring standards together, not only for documentation, but for how organizations talk to each other will be huge across the blockchain world and is something that I would welcome. I think one of the other things is around a trade execution dossier, quite often you find that at some stage in the journey, there are some questions about the documents, the completeness, the, and we, you, you've talked to Oswald a lot about the legal side of it. And I think we're, one of the reasons I'm on the call and Saqib as well is at some stage, we quite like to come to this uh, session and actually talk through what proof of trust does 
in dispute resolution, because particularly around a shipping trade execution dossier or any uh, trade agreement, rather than just digitally forming a smart contract, actually bringing in some legal SME expertise or external SME expertise is quite relevant. So certainly outside of this, <clears throat> I'll have a conversation with Oswald, but um, Saqib uh, will probably chip in in a minute, would be only too pleased to actually uh, talk about what we bring with Saqib delivering the, the um, IP and approach and IBM delivering the technology behind it. We'd be quite keen to talk about how dispute resolution plays in this space. Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you for um, uh, introducing the proof of trust to the group. And I'm very pleased to meet everybody here. I think Kevin's touched on a number of points there, which are, are quite relevant to introducing um, more efficient legal services or arbitration services into, you know, commerce and trade digitization. I think we've seen technology over the past five years uh, push uh, business technology uh, ahead of any kind of curve that we expected. But now we're seeing, certainly in a COVID world, the encumbrances of more traditional or legacy processes. And I think that's where proof of trust has kind of seen this opening in the market that if we're to encourage global trade, we have to ensure that all the efficient processes around this system uh, for the actual transaction itself are digitized. Uh, and that's certainly where proof of trust sees itself. It sees itself being an enabler, uh, connecting networks through one mission, which is to provide faster, better, fairer adjudication. And we enable that through blockchain. So we'll be really happy to contribute and, and have further discussions about it. I don't want to take up everyone's time today. I know that we're, we're reaching a close, but certainly Proof of Trust would like to contribute a little bit to this and, and share some of our, our thinking and some of our experience. I'd love to hear more. Maybe yes. that's the next session. We, yes, we should uh, line you up, uh, Shakib. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and Andrea, we should discuss that offline. Absolutely, yeah. We'd be grateful to uh, to contribute. Thank you. And mindful of the time, it's already uh, uh, close to an hour. So, and anything else, Andrea, before we close the call? No, that's all for my side. Oswald for his time. He did a great job, and uh, looking forward to going on with uh, with everybody available to contribute. And again uh, in two weeks time gonna have... yeah in the boring world of icc oswald is a fresh a fresh uh, <laughs> you know sense so thank you so much for bringing the excitement into icc thank you we're, we're going to change the world we're going to change the world <laughs> excellent thank you everybody thank you. take care keep care guys Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right.